Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. As I was here today, uh, began to prepare over the message, I got here about one o'clock and I just began to pray. And about two and a half hours in, and I was just like, well, you know, a lot of times you're gathering thoughts for a sermon, but I just got lost in, in the Holy Spirit. I just, I just got lost in it, and, and just God began to show me some things. And I really, I don't claim to be a prophet, but I really felt something prophetic is that what I feel like God is wanting to do tonight is to restore in some people their self-worth and the value uh, that God has for them and the value that, that they see their self. I think sometimes we get life's experiences and maybe we get down on ourselves. I don't know, but I just really felt like the Lord just kept dealing with me on that was people need to reestablish their worth and their value. Uh, in the book of Jeremiah, he took me to this passage here and I was reading and I was it's not not Jackie Chan Francis Chan <laughs> I always want to say <laughs> Jackie Chan I don't know if I need to j quote Jackie Chan or not <laughs> Francis Chan I was reading one of his books here several months ago <laughs> I don't even know any Jackie Chan quotes, so I'll have to look some up for next time. But he, he, he brought me, uh, when I was reading this book, he brought his readers to, this, uh, to f the first chapter in Jeremiah, and in verses 4 and 5. And I've never looked at it this way before. I've always, um, and maybe you have, but this was, new, this was new to me. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And we are formed to carry out a plan that God designed. And I know a lot of times, I, I would look at it this way, okay, God made me, and then because he made me, then he... Uh, has to well I've done made John now I've got to make a plan for him <laughs> but in all reality what he was telling Jeremiah he said before I form before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations God had a set plan he needed a prophet to the nations and then he formed Jeremiah to do that plan you know so we have to quit looking at like God just tripped one day and made Charlotte and say, whoops, <laughs> now I've got to make a plan. <laughs> but no, he made a plan, and then he formed Charlotte to do that plan. we got to get that. God didn't slip and trip one day and make you. He, he made a plan, and then he formed you to do that plan. I just thought that was so powerful. And I wanted to lay that foundation there tonight before I go any further. Um, because, as I said, I think one thing we need to really do is to, to really follow through with the plan that God has for us. We've got to determine that our worth doesn't come from accomplishments and things. It comes from what God made me to do. That means God sat down. It's hard for us to get that wrapped around our mind because we deal with time like here on earth 24 hours in a day. We get sleepy and we need to go to bed. But God doesn't work on that schedule. He sits down and he took time and formed every one of us. And he made a plan and formed us to that plan. If you want to turn to 1 Samuel 16. I began to, uh, I had two messages today. And Susan preached both of them this morning. So, in saying that, I've just always know that God, I didn't, we didn't talk <laughs> at, at all about, you know, she just, Texted me Friday and asked if I could teach, and I'm not sure. But God began to deal with me about David and Saul, and she mentioned some of that this morning, and also about seed planting. 
and, and I have both of those. So we're just going to follow what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Um, because I was thinking, you know, this is probably this, the only second time I've got up here and, and I don't have an outline in, in over 20 years of speaking. And I thought, well, I'm not getting anything. So I just sat in my office. I turned on YouTube and I went to RCC and I, I, saw, I just come to the first one and it was Pastor Tom. And I clicked on it. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was he said, you know, there's a lot of people that do outlines. He said, but a lot of times I don't even know what I'm going to speak till the day of. And I thought, well, man, if that's good enough for him, it's good enough, <laughs> good enough for me. So <laughs> we're pulling an old Tom Underhill <laughs> tonight. So, uh, But anyways, 1 Samuel 16, I was thinking about, I was just, my mind began to go um, here about self-worth and also about preparation time. You know, there's a lot of times when God has us in places and we, you ever been somewhere and you're like, God, you even know where I am? Or you feel like maybe what you're doing is insignificant or you maybe feel like you're not making a difference. And my mind began to go here and um, start in verse 6 and it says, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab, talking about Samuel, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of the stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, ruddy, whatever that, how you say that, and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now you can go to chapter 17 and go to verse 34 and it said and David said unto Saul this is whenever we were uh, whenever Goliath was standing making uh, all this noise and they stood for four I read the 40 days they sat there and listened to this guy you would have thought sometime down the road somebody would have got sick of that and said I'll just take my chances but you know, it's easy for me to say sitting on this side but in verse 34 it says and David said unto Saul thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So I read these two here because when David was taking care of his father's sheep, there was no one watching him when he killed the bear and the lion. There was nobody there to congratulate him on those accomplishments. He was on the back 40 uh, by himself. You know, there was nobody there to say, man, you know, Jesse didn't say, man, did you see the bear that David killed? We're going to make a rug out of it and put it in front of the fireplace. What a trophy. He, none of that happened. He did it just because it needed to be done. Nobody was watching. And nobody was there to congratulate him or see what he was doing. It says, more than that, I believe what God was doing in that time. Even though nobody saw it, God saw it. But it's not just that God saw it. This is what God was doing for David. If you, when you turn to chapter 17, what he was getting him ready for, he was preparing him. He was getting him ready to face Goliath. And you know, sometimes we feel like what we do, if we're not careful, goes unnoticed because it doesn't have the glamour or the, light, the lights on you. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, that's not all it's cracked up to be, okay? So, but here's the thing. There's a lot of times people go and they feel like it's unnoticed or nobody's paying attention or that we're just back in the middle of, of nowhere and we're trying to we're, we're, we're before God we're going after God we're seeking God we're doing everything we know to do but it seems that it's going unnoticed and I tell you what brought it uh, more alive to me was if you go back to chapter 16 and in verse 10 
And when it says, and again, when Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hadn't chosen these, and Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? It's almost as if Jesse never had the plans of even letting Samuel know that David even existed. If you read in other translations, Jesse was like, oh, man, I've got, yeah, I forgot. I've got David on the back 40 watching my sheep for me. I mean, surely he's not the one. But you know, in the, it, it, sometimes that's the way people feel. They feel like they go unnoticed or unvalued. So you, sometimes when we feel that way, and I'm not saying David felt that way, but it seemed as if Jesse uh, was, wasn't even going to bring him up. And sometimes we feel like we don't have the ability or the look that it takes to do ministry. But I like what verse 7, it said that the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance. And you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in that. But he said, but God looketh on the heart. You know, my mind this all weekend, and I've got two different things up here, and one was going to be relatively easy for me because I already had it. I just found something old, and not old, but something, I guess, safe. And I just really felt the Lord challenge me today. He said that you could do what's safe or you can follow me. So I'm just going to step out here and take the information that I receive that says that we operate in the anointing. I know that. Now it's time to put it to work. All weekend after Susan had texted me, I began to think in my mind the past four or so years. And, Mount, and keep this in mind. The church that I came from is full of wonderful people. I believe on their way to heaven, they supported me. Uh, they listened to a lot of, to some bad ones, Ed. <laughs> and I, hopefully they listened to a few good ones. But I remember when I took that position, I, I, I was sitting back in the, in, in the office that, that I have now. And man, I'm going to tell you right now, the staff and Pastor Susan, all, they set me up so good. I mean, beautiful desk, nice computer chair, just a I mean, I was just so proud. You know, not that that's, not that means anything, but I was just, I sat down in that, and my mind began to go back to where I come from, and I remember when I took the position, they gave me this little bitty room, and um, I remember I went and got a desk from Good Deal Charlie, and I think what it used to be was a display that J.C. Penney's used to use, and I made it into <laughs> a makeshift desk. I had this old HP computer. I think it had Windows 95, you know. So it was, it was old, and I had one little bitty Bible program. I bought this, you know, really cheap office chair from Walmart. I, but, I, I, I mean, I had my office. I was so proud to have that. And somebody felt sorry for me and got me a couch. It kind of looked like Joseph's coat. You know, it has all kind of different colors. And they bought me some deer hunting pictures because they knew I liked that. And, and, they put <laughs> and they put that on there for me. But I remember sitting in that office and I, I had to, it was, they called it bivocational. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of ministers here under, understand that, bivocational. And so you had, that meant they were going to give you some money, but you were going to get another job and be on call the rest of the time. <laughs> but that was okay. That was okay. I'm getting to something here, so just hang with me. But I remember to do that, I had to get up very early in the morning. A lot of times I was there at 4.30. And I'm not... Keep in mind, I'm not bragging on me, okay? I'm just telling you my experience, all right? But I had to get up very early in the morning in order to be there and to spend a little time before I had to go to my secular job. And I remember in those quiet times, there would be times when I felt like, Tom, I was like, man, not that you want to be noticed, like you want somebody to brag on you or pat you on the back, but just wondering, am I even doing any good? Does any ministers here, when you get done speaking, wonder, Mark, can you testify? You've asked your teen on the way home, did that make any sense? Yeah. Right? Pastor Susan can testify to that. So many, Bob, did it make any sense? And you, and you rack your brain wondering if you're doing any good. Is this really making a difference? Is it, am I really significant? And in those quiet times, especially the night or the morning after you spoke, you would sit in that office in the wee hours of the morning feeling sometimes like you flopped, feeling like it wasn't any good, feeling like you were just this high to the ground, off the ground. 
and wondering, is this even any good? But I look back on that now and realize this, that in that time, that it wasn't about knocking one out of the park. And it wasn't about how good or how bad he was doing. It was about God was preparing me. And I think sometimes we hear, we get used to being at a place so long that we don't see just how big of a deal that it is. And I remember walking through this door for the first time. And I wondered what was going on, God. Had, I mean, I thought for sure where I was at, I was supposed to take over lead pastor. I just thought, you know, that, that was the, what was supposed to happen. And God was like, totally changed that whole plan. And I left there just totally wondering what in the world is going on. But even in that two years, God was preparing me. And I remember walking through that door back there. And I mean, let me tell you something. Y'all may not feel like RCC is a big church, but let me tell you where I come from. This is a big church. Because I, I remember the first thought that I had when I walked through the door back there was like, could you imagine ever being the associate pastor at a church this size? I remember it's the first thought that I had. And not in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would be where I am right now. But then God began to deal with me even further and said, you think you're at the destination, but it's just the beginning. See, God's constantly always preparing us, getting us ready. And God was showing me today, he's like, I want to do great things. But I thought, well, God, that sounds so generic. You, anybody can say that. But then God began to show me, I'm wanting to do specific things. And we need to understand the value of ourself. We need to understand the value of our church and the mission that we have and the value that we have here and understand what's going over here, Bob, it ain't just kind of a big deal. It's a big deal. What we are doing here is a big deal. We, th I'm going to tell you something. I want to brag on RCC for a while. Reaching out into the community. You don't see a whole lot of churches doing that. People that walk through this door and showing compassion and helping people, feeding people, giving people counseling, helping people with a better life and, and giving them an, an ear to listen to. Let me tell you, it's a big deal what's going on here and we need to understand the value. But sometimes we as individuals, we, we lose that getting back on track here. We lose our sense of value. Let me tell you, David was back out there in that back 40 and God was preparing him. Sometimes what we feel like we're doing is not significant. Maybe it's just working. A lot of people look at that, just working in the nursery. Are you kidding me? Those are the most formable minds in this church. The children's church, Carolyn and Marilyn. Carolyn, Karen and Marilyn. Blah, I'll spit it out in a minute. The most formable minds in your class. In this church. They're at a spot where they don't have the ability to doubt yet. Man, take me back to that place. <laughs> don't ever think what you're doing is insignificant. I don't care if it's taking up the offering, whatever it is. It's important to the kingdom of God. And God is preparing you for something even bigger and even better. God looked at David's heart. You know, if you read through these few uh, passages here, you'll see that Saul was a very paranoid person. He was always constantly scared that somebody was going to take his place. But yet David, because of the heart he had, was very confident. His preparation time had brought him into this. He knew his value. He knew his value. He understood that, especially after, and look at the confidence that he had whenever he talked to Goliath. In 17, in verses 45, it says, Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom, that's, whom thou hast defied. And look, now you don't want to talk about, comp we're talking about, a, they, the way I understand he's kind of small in stature, kind of just a good looking, preppy looking guy. But what he, I like what he said. He said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. He said, I'm going to cut your head off. I thought, man, that's pretty bold. <laughs> but you know what? God had prepared him, and I, he knew this. I killed the bear, and I killed the lion. And let me tell you right now, they had a lot more uh, aggression than you got. And if he took care of me then, he's going to take care of me on this. He had a heart 
that means this to bethink heart means to bethink themselves or to understand that word bethink means to consider and the word understand means the power of comprehending he had considered and knew the power and was able to comprehend where his strength had come from whenever we start talking about our value and we start talking about our purpose there's one thing that I don't think that we look to when we're throwing and I don't not not I don't want to say a pity party okay but we've I've thrown some I mean it, it happens but I think one thing that we we do sometimes is we what we don't realize is when we're talking about our self-worth and our self-value there's one thing that we we forget to rely on and that and it's a word that gets used very loosely and a lot of times it loses its meaning and or its effectiveness not not its meaning but its effectiveness in our life because we use the word so much and it's this is the anointing when people are having difficult times and they're constantly down their self constantly 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 one of the first things I like to ask them is are you filled with the Holy Spirit you see David went in the power of what God gave him the ability to do, not in his own power. See, Saul was going in his own power. If you look in the book of Samuel, the 13th chapter, there's one thing there that Samuel said in verse 12. Whenever Samuel was delayed in coming, and in verse 12 it said this, whenever Saul, or when Samuel come in, it's like, hey, what are you doing? He said, therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. The message translation said this, instead of saying I forced myself, it said this, so I took matters into my own hands. The difference between Saul and David is that David relied on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to know your value unless you know it through the anointing. And that, well, the anointing means this right here. I'm not going by my feelings. And I'm not going by what I see. I'm not going to go by what I feel. I'm going to go by faith. So David relied upon the anointing in order to understand what his value is. And we, when we understand what our value is and we begin to speak, there's the thing. When we begin to speak what God's word says about us, you know, because David said this, uh, he uh, in verse uh, in chapter seventeen that he came to him in the in uh, the. Hang on here. Anyways, he was going to come to him in the name of the Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> I've lost my place. But he was coming to him in the name of the... He wasn't coming to him in his own power. He didn't take matters into his own hands. He sought the Lord. And he depended upon him. And we have to plant that seed inside of us. I talked to our Sunday school class here just a few weeks ago about planting the seed. Uh, and, you know, the, the thing when we plant that seed of self-value and understand... Because here's the thing. You'll never be... You'll, it's going to be hard to do anything for God if you don't know what your self-value is and what God's value of you is. And understanding that sometimes when everybody's not seeing what we're doing, that it's not that nobody sees what we're doing or we don't have any value, is that God is preparing us for something great. And we sow that seed. Whether that's, um, you know, Susan talked about that today, whether that's healing, whether that's finances, whether that's where I'm at as far as what God made me to do or what God wants me to be. We have to plant that seed of what God's word says. And whenever God gives us a dream and a vision, just like I said earlier, I would sit in that office and God would begin to show me things. God would begin to reveal things to me. I remember there was one, I just, God had given, or I, I just thought we, I wanted to have a gym for our kids over at the church. I just thought I want, I just, we needed one. We went through the whole process we got with the city. We went through all these plans and then it went to the board and it just hit a screeching halt. And I just remember being so down because we were just we had worked so hard and it just they didn't see the need for it and all that. And and Tom, I just believe I was I was just for sure that's what God wanted because I thought we got to give them kids somewhere to go because if we don't, they're going to go somewhere. And they, you know, they may be fighting and fussing around, but let them fight and fuss over here. We can kind of referee that. But in my mind, I kind of wondered what was going on. Well, the other day when we had our men uh, men's breakfast, I had some stuff to get together. 
and Ellie came with me, and she was over in the gym playing basketball while I was getting some stuff, and I went over there, and I was shooting baskets with her. And when we, I wouldn't even pay attention to what I was doing, but I was just bouncing the ball back to her. And God began to remind me, you remember when you wanted that gym? And he said, you're standing in it. And I brought Ellie over, and I said, you remember? And she said, I remember. Remember when we talked about that over there? Yeah. I said, we're standing in it right now. See, God was preparing. Maybe it wasn't the way I thought it was going to happen, but God was preparing. Let me tell you right now, when we left over there, sometimes in that preparation time, things can get ugly. <laughs> Growth can be ugly. You ever seen preteen? Their nose is bigger than their head and got size 15 shoes and their voice is high one day and low the next. It's ugly. <laughs> it's, not, it's not attractive. But you know, sometimes growth is ugly. And I remember when we left over there, I just got so discouraged. And I remember telling somebody, I'm never going to preach again. I just, I don't want to do it no more. And uh, they would ask me, and I would tell Tom, I'd tell him I was retired. <laughs> retired from public speaking anyways. But I remembered God still, we come over here, we started learning about the faith messages, about sowing seed, and I realized I had to quit talking certain ways, I had to quit saying certain things, and realized I had to plant a seed that if God had, it, sometimes I felt like David, I felt like I was in the back 40, and nobody knew where I was. Sometimes I wondered if even God knew where I was at. But you know what? God was preparing me. He was getting me ready. Sometimes I still drive over here just like, it's just I, I almost have to just stop and like pinch myself because I was like, I, I just, it's, I'm going to tell you, I just never dreamed that I would be able to get to be a part of something like this and how awesome that this is. I, I remember wanting... And I'm not trying to bore you. I'm just trying to communicate with you, okay? I remember at, the, at where we were, I wanted to do like groups like, and just have get-togethers and just get people fired up about being in fellowship. And I just like, why is this not working? And I didn't know in that time God was preparing me for what was ahead. Me and my wife sat on the bed last night. I said, did you ever think in 100 years we'd be where we are right now? It just blows me away that, you know, in that time that God was preparing me I feel like there are people in here today, you're kind, of in a, you're kind of in a dip, maybe. And you wonder what's going on. I'm telling you, I just feel like God wants me to tell you he's preparing you. He's getting you ready, not just for something big. He's getting you ready for something specific. And you just need to grab that seed and you need to plant it in the ground, okay? And part of that method that God wants us to take when it comes to seed time and harvest is really not about technique, but more about our attitude when we plant that seed. That word attitude is, this here in the Webster's, is a position assumed for a specific purpose or a posture. I left my um, object lesson in my office, <laughs> so you just have to use your imagination. But I use this in the class. There's a lot of times when you get a pot and you put dirt in it and you put the seed in it, and a lot of times we take this position when it comes to faith. We water that seed and we sit it and then we just watch it. And watch it. Look at our watch. Why is it not growing yet? I just planted it five minutes ago. Why is it not growing? Why is it not growing? God, I planted my seed. Is why In the physical, when, has anybody ever planted a garden before? Okay. You got faith to know you, put, you prepare the soil, you put the seed in the ground, and you water it. And I have faith enough to walk away that, to know this, that God knows what he's doing. <laughs> and when you put that seed in the ground, you can watch that seed all you want to, but you do not have the power to make that seed grow. You can watch it all day. And you can... Uh, uh, you know, just, I want to make that seed grow. I'm going to put extra water on it. I'm going to put extra sunlight. That seed is only going to grow as fast as it was intended to grow. Okay? It's the same in our faith. We need to have enough faith that when we plant the seed that God knows what he is doing. God has, meant, God has a method to 
the seed time and harvest. And typically, it only requires what would seem insignificant action on our part. Here's a great example, and this was from Willie George at the minister's conference. Uh, In Mark 16 and 18, it says, And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. What did he tell us to do? Lay hands. It's not your job to recover them. It's not your job to heal them. It's just your job to... That seems so insignificant. But that's all God asks you to do. In Mark 11 and 23, it says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain... What did he say? Did he tell you to move the mountain? No, he told you to say unto the speak to the mountain. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. That's God's job to do that. And shall not doubt. He just said, don't doubt. Speak, don't doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. You cannot, it's not your job to move the mountain. It's your job to speak, to not have doubt, and just to believe. Even in John chapter 2, whenever... Uh, Jesus uh, turned the water into wine. What did he tell them to do? He told them to fill the water part, water pots with water. He didn't tell them to turn it into wine. He just said fill them up with water. Most of the things that God requires from us, um, they're not really insignificant. They're just easy. And a lot of times we want to like take it in, like we want to be like Saul. I'll, I'll, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm tired of waiting. I waited on you. You were supposed to be here at this time. Now I'm going to take matters into my own hands and do what? I'm going going to make this happen. I'm going to force this in. Whenever we take that stance, then we're frustrating the grace of God. But they're, they're just easy in the sense that in the dispensation of grace, he never meant for our part to be difficult. Matthew 11, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor. That word labor means to feel fatigue or to be wearied and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He didn't say it was your job to get rest. It's your job to come unto him. Colossians 1.14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. That word redemption means riddance, as in like good riddance, and relief. In whom, not in me. He said, in whom we have, not in ourself. You're never going to find relief in yourself. You're only going to find it in, the, in, uh, in Christ. That's why in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 it says this, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. What's that word increase mean? To grow. It's my job to plant, my job to water, but God's the one that's going to grow it. You're not going to grow it. That's why when you're in, the, in that dip and you're wondering what in the world is going on, hey, let me tell you something. You're not going to force that in. You're not going to force that in. It's going to take time. Uh, but God never asks us to produce the harvest. He only wants us to put the seed in the ground and water and tend to it. So what do you do when you plant a garden? Again, we don't just stare at the ground after we plant and water the seed. Man, that would take forever. And it's going to grow in the same amount of time. But if you just sit there and watch it, all the time, every day, every hour, Kim, you know what? It's going to wear you out. That's why we believe in God for a healing. You can run to the mirror every five minutes and you are going to wear yourself out. That's not what God told us to do. He said to plant the seed, water it, and have enough faith to walk away knowing he's going to grow that. Isaiah 40 and 31, it says this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That word wait means this, to expect. Now, a lot of times when we talk about waiting, there's a lot of people feels like this. I think we need to be very careful when we speak about this. There is a waiting process. But there is also a set time to receive. A lot of times we hear messages on waiting, and we, in our minds, even though they're not saying all you're ever going to get to do is wait, in our minds, if we're not careful, we're going to feel like, okay, I planted the seed. Now all I'm ever going to get out of this is waiting on this. Whenever God is saying we do have to wait, we have to wait for the plant to grow. But there is a set time to receive. I remember we planted a garden, and we thought we needed six squash plants. For, and me and Mandy was the only one going to eat squash. Has anybody ever grown squash in here? I'm going to tell you, when that stuff gets going, you, you're out there every day. 
And if you're not, you're going to have squash that's so tough you can't even eat it. But you know what? We, we knew that when you plant that, we didn't just sit there and stare at it. But you know what? It began to, one day it began to produce fruit. And we had to, I mean, we had to cut it up. We were freezing it. We were giving it away. We couldn't keep up with it all. So I'm, what I'm trying to get at is this. When you put that seed in the ground, when you're believing God that's going to do something great inside of your life, put the seed in the ground, water it, and have enough faith to walk away that know what God's doing. And there is going to be a set time to receive. There is going to be a harvest. But only God can grow things. You can't make it happen. So this is what I want to say to you in this. Stop putting pressure on yourself. It's not going to happen any quicker just because you think about it all the time. You're going to wear yourself out. It's God that does the impossible. So many times my focus has been on the increase or what God wants to do in my life that I forget about my part, and that's the posture of planting the seed, which is the word, and watering that seed with the word. Let me say this, too, in closing. When we're talking about planting those seeds and going back to planting the seed of our self-worth and our value that God has. And when I say self, not, not that you finally feel good about you, but understanding what, how God feels about you. There's sometimes where we always feel like that we're all, like I said, we're always going to be this, even if we know there's a set time to receive, we feel like it's going to be this super long waiting process, right? But as I began to pray over this, when I was studying for this lesson, um, there's just, God just dropped this. He said, who said you had to wait on everything? You know, God definitely knows when we need something now. Mark 5 and 29, it says, In straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. That word straightway means immediately. That's why when this, we're asking God to do, like especially when it comes to, when we ask God for a healing, healing's gradual. Miracles are instantaneous. But God's able to do the miraculous. And, you know, I'm saying this today. We, we need to be very, uh, we need to be mindful of what we ask for. But don't let fear keep you from calling out for the miracle. Don't let fear stop you from believing for a miracle. In that, because miracles still happen, or they wouldn't have a name for it. So I want you to understand tonight, if you bow your heads real quick, I just wanted you to be able to plant the seed of your value tonight. Does that make sense? I wanted you to plant the seed of your value tonight. I, wanted you to, I want you to understand your worth. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.